Hey, podcast listener. Even if you're alone on your journey towards improved health, fitness, and vitality, know that today you're surrounded by hundreds of people from around the world who are pursuing the same goals you are. If you're interested in learning more about this program or about succeeding on a raw food diet, then check out our website, raw-food-health.net. My name is Andrew Perlot. Welcome to the Raw Food Health Podcast, episode 27. In the fall of 1806, Lewis and Clark were bushwhacking their way back across the United States, trying to return home after their voyage to the Pacific. They ran out of food, they couldn't find any game to hunt, and they had run out of all the rations they'd bought from the Indians, but they could find one thing, the pawpaw fruit. According to their journals, they subsisted on pawpaw for almost a month before they could find other food, and they wrote they really liked it. George Washington liked the pawpaw so much that he had it chilled and served as dessert. Thomas Jefferson thought enough of them that he had them planted at his estate at Monticello. During the Civil War, several regiments actually disobeyed orders and camped out in pawpaw orchards are along their route of march instead of actually continuing on because you know who would rather fight if you could eat pawpaws u.s settlers and native americans all ate pawpaw they all knew what it was but today no one really knows about the pawpaw it is the biggest native fruit it's bigger than your fist it's really tasty and no one knows about it I've eaten the pawpaw myself. I think it's incredibly tasty. If you've ever tried um, sweet sop or sour sop or cherimoya, it's of the same family and it has a similar but definitely distinct and unique taste unto itself. So to discuss this fruit and why most people don't know anything about it despite it being really interesting and, you know, native to the United States, um, we're going to be talking to Chris Smeal. Chris is the owner of Integration Acres, a farm that specializes in pawpaw production in Athens County, Georgia. He's also uh, the head of the pawpaw, uh, the Ohio Pawpaw Growers Association. And beginning in 1999, he's organized a yearly tribute to the pawpaw, the uh, Ohio Pawpaw Festival. First, though, we have news and shoutouts. been a while since the last episode of the Raw Food Health Podcast, and uh, let's just say there's been some uh, illness in my family, so I have been kind of busy with that, and I've just let it, let it fall aside uh, so I could work on some other projects. But it is uh, a new season. We've got uh, the pawpaw harvest coming up, so I thought it would be a good time to revive the Raw Food Health podcast with some uh, new input from uh, someone who knows about pawpaws. If you're subscribed to the rawfoodhealth.net newsletter, you've heard that I'm actually about a month into an interesting experiment, which I'm calling the overfeeding experiment, but in reality, it's a different way of eating. Normally, I have kept my weight where I wanted by eating the amount of calories that experience tells me it takes to stay at that level. And uh, basically, I'm, you know, I'm, it's not like I'm starving myself or anything. I'm just eating enough. But, uh, you know, there are times where it would be like, hmm, you know, I could I could certainly eat more. Um, you know, if I if I didn't have any restraint, I would just keep eating. I, I love to eat, so it's not like any problem. But, you know, that would lead to weight gain. So I'm basically trying to experiment what happens when you just eat um, as much as you want, you know, eating normal, healthy, raw foods that I always eat. But as much as I want, um, any time that I'm hungry, it's a binary decision. If, if, if you see food in front of you and the answer is, uh, you say, am I hungry? And if the answer is yes, then you eat it. And if the answer is no, you don't eat it. Now, uh, this is in response to something I've talked about on this podcast, which has failed a lot of my coaching clients, and that is the idea that, you know, it's basically just that you have this repressed um, metabolic rate because you've been starving yourself or whatnot, and that if only 
you would just go ahead and eat as much as you want. You're, you would eventually just get thin somehow. It would catch up, in other words. Um, well, a lot of people have tried that and failed, and I've always said, you know, probably not the smartest idea. But honestly, I've never tried it, so um, I'm one month into that experiment. So if you're interested and you want to know what's happened to me when I'm just eating as much as I want, um, you can check out uh, my YouTube account. Uh, I'll have a link in the show notes, and uh, you can read about it there or watch about it there. Actually, there have been a number of articles that have gone up uh, at the website. I'm not going to talk all about them now, but if you want to stay up to date on these things, the best thing to do is just subscribe to the newsletter. Um, you can also probably find them at the uh, rawfoodhealth.net. So uh, let's get into the shout-outs. Um, so uh, Kaylee's... Kaylin's mommy writes, I love to listen to these podcasts and have learned so much about so many different topics. I highly recommend this podcast. Uh, Reedy writes, this was a great podcast. I like that fact that you will talk about controversial issues. It's important to tell it all and to know the truth. Thanks. And regular MT guy writes, helpful and accurate information with a scientific basis for eating a healthy and for eating raw and healthy. So uh, thanks guys for those five star reviews. Um, do me a favor if you enjoy the Raw Food Health podcast and you want it to re- want it to grow, uh, do me a favor, go on to the iTunes store, find the Raw Food Health podcast, and give me a five star review. Tell me what you like about the show. I read out the best feedback in subsequent episodes. And finally, I'm just going to give you a quick raw food tip of the week. Um, Something that my coaching clients often say to me, and actually this just came up in a coaching session that I did uh, yesterday, um, is that they're fine in the beginning of the day. They get through their breakfast and their lunch, but by the time dinner comes around or early evening, they're craving junk food. They want potato chips. They want that McDonald's hamburger, french fries, whatever it may be, and um they they always think about it in terms of, oh, you know, this raw food just isn't working for me. But um, almost in all these cases, when I actually ask them what they've ate in the first part of the day, they I look at the food log and I see that they've eaten really just a fraction of the calories that they should have eaten, often less than half. And um, so I actually, this was a tip that I gave out yesterday, but um, it's worked for a number of my clients before. And that is very simply, if you get to the point and you're now in early evening and you just want that unhealthy item that you probably shouldn't have, here's a tip. Every 15 minutes for an hour, eat three bananas. 15 minutes go by, eat another three bananas for an entire hour. Just do it. So in other words, you'll be in uh, uh, 12, 12 bananas by the end of it. If you can go through that hour and still have any desire for junk food, then go ahead and eat it. You know, I mean, <laughs> because basically what's happening is um, you, you've just under eaten and you think, oh, I'm craving something. But in reality, your body has a reference point set up and it knows what's calorically dense. Very often it will tell you, oh, go get those salty, fatty potato chips. They're high in calories. I know those will satisfy me because you're starving me on all this raw food. But um, if you just start piling on those bananas, Um, At the end of the day, you'll most likely find that those cravings just disappear. So uh, that is my tip, and uh, I hope it's useful to some of you. It's time for our interview with Chris Smeal of the Ohio Pawpaw Growers Association. So without further ado, let's bring him on. The uh, pawpaw, I, I've had it myself, and it's delicious and uh, really interesting fruit, but I think most of my listenership probably has not had a chance to taste it. So could you just tell us uh, how you would describe it to the average person who's never had anything but, you know, the normal apples and peaches and bananas? Yes, it's North America's largest native tree fruit, and it's in the tropical fruit family custard apple, Anonaceae, and it's got 2,100 uh, cousins in that family. Like you mentioned, soursop, caramoya, guanabana, and so it's got a very tropical flavored taste, and it looks almost like a, almost like a green banana, like a little squat, not as long. 
um, or like almost like a potato up in the tree. It's got a soft green colored um, skin. And then on the inside, it's a bright yellow or, or it's an orange color. And it's got some pod-like seeds on the inside that you don't eat. And you don't usually eat the skin. The skin's got a little bitterness and grittiness to it. And it's very tropical flavored. The, the uh, texture of the pawpaw is custardy. Um, and it's, you know, can get, you don't want to eat them underripe. So you want to make sure they're soft and aromatic and fruity smelling. If you eat them when they're underripe, they can actually make you sick. So you want to make sure they're not like hard and white, but more of a, you know, cream, creamy, soft and fruity smelling. And, uh, yeah, most people, first time they try them, they're amazed at something that's growing in America right in your backyard. Yeah, and, and I would agree that it seems like such a tropical delicacy that it's almost unbelievable that it's a temperate climate fruit. And, and I, I believe it's the only edible member of the Ananasi family, if I pronounce that correctly, which does grow in the temperate, temperate climate. Is that correct? Well, the, the Anonaceae of Anonaceae, is the custard apple family, and most of that is tropical. Mm. And it's it's supposedly the only one in the temperate zone in that family, though I think that's worth a little bit of further investigation. There, they, there's people that think there's um, some temperate uh, anonas in, like, the highlands of the Philippines and stuff like that. Mm. So... Um, and, uh, I'm sorry, go on. Well, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question or not. But. Yeah, it does. Um, so in the United States, the, the native range, you're in Ohio, your farm, uh, which is, yeah. uh, kind of like pawpaw central and it's, but, yeah. but the pawpaw itself seems to have a native range throughout the mid Atlantic States and through the South, maybe as far West as Texas or so, but even farther than that, it can grow in different areas for, I, I've, I know someone who or someone who claimed to be growing them in uh, Southern Canada and in Connecticut over here. I know people who grow them in their backyards. So it seems like, um, even even outside of the native range, there's quite a bit of uh, a, quite a few areas where you can actually grow these. Absolutely, um, Ohio. There was a contest by the American Genetic Association back in I think it was like 1904 or something like that, and they had this competition for the best pawpaw, and they had people sent stuff in from Michigan and Florida and. Five out of the top ten best pawpaws came from Ohio, hmm. southern Ohio in particular. So for whatever reason, yes, we're blessed with really great pawpaws in southern Ohio, and that's like a zone six, I think. And uh, But, yeah, they're growing pawpaws all over the world now. Um, they're growing in Europe and in Asia. So there's a, there's a lot of interest. It's pretty adaptable. It's got... You can grow it in the shade, I and mean, it's naturally it's like a it's an understory tree. And what people have done is, like a lot of other fruits, like limes and lemons and oranges that were also understory trees, you take it out of the understory, you put it out in the full sun, and grow it in an orchard setting, and you're going to get a lot more fruit like that. Mm. So that's pretty much what is being promoted as the way to grow pawpaws. You know, a lot of times people are familiar with them if they're naturalists and they like to hike and they, you know, identify different trees. But as far as fruit production goes, you want them in the sun. Uh, it's a great landscape tree and uh, it doesn't have a lot of bugs or disease problems. It's also the host of the zebra swallowtail butterfly, hmm. which is the longest tailed swallowtail butterfly in America. So, yeah, those are some of the other uses of the pawpaw. Also, they're using it to fight cancer. They've got these really powerful chemicals inside of every cell of the pawpaw called anonaceous acetogenins. And these have been uh, worked on and developed. There's a professor at Purdue University named Dr. Jerry McLaughlin, and he helped the, 
kind of study those, and he turned those chemicals into, like, a lice shampoo, a flea and tick shampoo, and then these, um, what they use with, in chemotherapy to, during, um, it helps, like, eliminate, if they're, like, trying to get rid of a cancer, this helps weaken the cancer and completely destroy it, supposedly, so. Hmm. Um, and a lot of people even make their own medicines and use them for, like, heart stints and prostate cancer. I mean, it's it's really amazing. At the Pawpaw Festival, people who've been touched by the Pawpaw wind up showing up, and, you know, you hear a lot of stories about how people have used it. Now, um, here's here's the thing. So we've got this fruit, which tastes amazing and is probably bigger than your fist. So it's like, you know, a significant sized fruit and you can grow it all along the United States. And yet I would guess that the majority of people, perhaps outside of like, you know, Ohio or whatnot, have probably never heard of it. So um, I know that it comes down to shipability and that the um, it just it's not something that transports well. And so doesn't fit into our traditional uh, um, produce distribution network, which can often ship stuff for days across the United States. So I was wondering, you know, do you, how do you see that? Like, how do you come at that from a producer and, and for, uh, you know, you're the, you're the head of the Ohio Paw Paw Growers Association. How do you guys think about this? Is this, do you just see it, oh, well, we're, we're stuck producing this as a local fruit, it's never going to fit in on a uh, on a larger distribution network sense or do you or do you see it as perhaps with breeding it can get tougher or, or exactly what do you what do you kind of look at that as well my what i've done is with our business called integration acres we've really tried to pioneer the processing of the pawpaw because that fragility it is a challenge so you know, turning the problems into a solution, I guess I, I worked on being, a, a, you know, processing the pawpaw and freezing it, making products with it, jarred products, so it's available year-round. So you got your short shelf life, but if you're processing it, you can make it available year-round. Um, but, yeah, I think there's a lot of genetic diversity and there's a lot of work being done on selecting out varieties for different attributes, and some of them might be, you know, durability, thickness of the skin, and, and such. So uh, I think there's multiple ways of approaching, you know, the development of the pawpaw. And, uh, you know, we've really had a good time at the pawpaw festival with our pawpaw cook-off and just all the different ways that people have incorporated it into, you know, desserts and beverages and savory dishes. So there's, I think there's a lot of, a lot of uh, work that needs to be done on a pop off for sure. Now, uh, I found a paper that you wrote, I believe it was based on a grant from the USDA, and you talked about um, actually not even necessarily growing the pawpaw on a farm, but in its native range, like in Ohio, that you've actually gone in and just found wild-growing pawpaw trees and harvested these and kind of used them. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? How common are they in the wild, and how like feasible would that be if someone was in the right area to, to do that? Yeah, in my neighborhood, I'm in Athens County, Ohio, which is in southeast Ohio, I mean, there's literally thousands, if not millions, of pawpaw trees in, you know, in the in the countryside. What's really interesting about pawpaws, those chemicals, those anonaceous acetogen, acetogenins that protect the pawpaw from bugs and, and, you know, they're using it to fight cancer, those chemicals also protect the trees from being eaten by grazing animals. So in our... Hilly, we live in like the hill country of Ohio, and what happens is people are out, you know, they've got beef cattle or horses or goats. They'll go out and they'll eat all the brush, but they don't eat the pawpaw trees. And so another neat thing is the pawpaws fly pollinated. So the animals, they come in, they eat the stuff around the pawpaw tree, they fertilize the soil with their manure and um, then they also, because they're animals and with the poop and everything, they help provide pollination for it too. So it's a, 
you know, it, it is something, uh, if people are aware and in their communities, they might find a whole bunch of them. And right along that that latitude um, of where we're at, which is kind of like south of Columbus, about an hour, if you follow that into Indiana, like southern Indiana, southern uh, northern Kentucky, West Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, right, right along that zone, like to Washington, D.C., like that seems to be the real kind of like the vein of the native pawpaw, you know, as far as a lot of them that produce well. Now you get up a little bit farther north, you get down a little bit farther south, it seems like there's a little less, you know, it's not as strong of that vein of really prolific pawpaws, but they're still out there. And, it, you know, when people apply themselves, you can select out ones that are superior in your area and, you know, focus on those. You can take cuttings from trees and graft them onto the other root stocks, and it's uh, got a lot of potential for people. So tell us about the Ohio Pawpaw Festival. Uh, how did you start this, and uh, kind of what, what is the reaction been to that? Well, we're in our 15th year this year, and if you would like to come and be a judge at our Pawpaw Cook-Off or our best Pawpaw competition, you're the perfect kind of person because we like to have writers or bloggers. Um, so if you'd like to do that, feel free. Awesome. Thank um, you for the offer. And, uh, you know, basically it was like guerrilla marketing. And, uh, you know, when I first started working on the pawpaw stuff in, in Athens here, people kind of joked about it. It was kind of a, you know, pawpaw was kind of a goofy thing to people. And uh, I went to the, we, this little village in our area, Albany, and I, I asked them if they would um, make the official village tree the pawpaw. And uh, they agreed to do that. And so kind of worked with some local community folks and did our, you know, first festival. And we have music and local artists and all our food vendors have at least one pawpaw dish for sale. And then eventually we got into a beer garden. And last year we had five different microbreweries making five different styles of pawpaw beer. And we have a pawpaw eating contest, pawpaw cook-off with uh, desserts, beverages, breads, and savory dishes. And, uh, you know, basically, we've got a really good committee of people, and we put it on. This is our 15th year. We had about 8,000 people last year. And it's a really nice family festival. we got lots of kids stuff, lots of uh, educational things about kind of like sustainable living topics. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. So, um, the people who, or a lot of the people who listen to this show are actually people who eat raw food diets. They're really interested in fruit. So, uh, is this the kind of event particularly I, it caught my eye was the, the pawpaw eating contest. So what is that? Is that like you're on a timer? How much can you shovel down your throat? Or is it like a, a watermelon eating contest where it's volume or what, what is it? Well, what we do is we put, I think it's about a pound of pawpaws and it's got, we take this, we, we basically, we take the skins off and we just have the seeds and the pulp and you have to put your hands behind your back and you have to like suck all the pulp off the seeds and eat every, all the pulp off your plate and the person who does that the first, um, you know, wins. Gotcha. Now we, we have had raw folk, raw food folks that have come in like say from like uh, Massachusetts or something. They come in, they, they camp at Lake Snowden, where our, our festival is, and all around the, the whole lake, there are pawpaw trees. Mm. And, you know, these guys were canoeing around, picking pawpaws, they were walking around, picking them, you know, so it's like, it's amazing as far as you can just go out and just pretty much harvest a ton of pawpaw fruit. Um, and as far as the nutritional superiority of the pawpaw, it's got, it's got a lot of attributes for the, I think, raw food folks. It's got, um, compared to apples, bananas, and oranges, it's higher in niacin, calcium, phosphorus, manganese, magnesium, iron, copper, zinc, protein, fat, seven of the 11 essential amino acids. There's more antioxidants in half a pawpaw than there is in a whole apple or a whole pear. And, you know, we really haven't had 
a lot of study done on it yet, so there's going to be more and more information coming out, I'd say, in the future as different professors around the country work on, you know, developing the pawpaw further. By the way, I think... And, that... and our, oh, I'm our sorry, frozen go. pawpaw pulp is kind of, you know, a great way to incorporate the pawpaw year-round into smoothies. And that's, a you know, I, I think something that the raw food diet might might appreciate. So, um, actually, I uh, just was Googling pawpaws, and I saw that um, it's the, the uh, fruit of the state of Ohio. I'm curious, is that something that came about because of um, the recent advocacy, or is that a longstanding thing? Well, I mean, it, it's actually not the official state fruit. It's the official state native fruit. Oh, um, I see. <laughs> originally, originally, yeah, it was, it was my idea to try to make it the state fruit. And when we, when we started talking about it, I, I talked to our state senator and our, you know, representative, and there was no state fruit. Well, as soon as that conversation started, um, we've got obviously a lot of agriculture here in Ohio. And the uh, wound up getting to be the, uh, the state fruit was a tomato. Um, <laughs> our Department of Agriculture is located in this town called Reynoldsburg, and they have a tomato festival, and, you know, we obviously have a pretty large tomato industry here in Ohio. So we uh, came up with this idea as a compromise. It's the state native fruit. And I I think we're the, one of the only states in, a, in America that has an official state native fruit. Mm. And people are pretty excited. You know, the pawpaw is a little more interesting than the, and then the tomato. Um, but, yeah, we're just the official state native fruit. And um, so... Have you been successful in getting the pawpaw into farms to be grown on a commercial level and perhaps getting it out into into grocery stores or uh, local farmers markets? Would you say you've made some progress? Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, I think that um I think the pawpaw is probably going to be more available at your farmers market in, in the in the big picture like in the, in the in the near future because, you know, the fragility of it um, and just like, as far as, you know, people who might be growing apples and or, or uh, apples and pears and stuff, they, they can, I'm, I'm noticing that some of those traditional orchards are putting in some pawpaws, you know, they're putting in some persimmons and, you know, some of the native fruits. And, uh, as far as, yeah, the, the whole distribution system and the whole way our, you know, grocery stores are. If it's not available year round, it's it's almost like something they don't even think about. And I don't know if the pawpaw is ever. I mean, it's not going to be grown tropically for us to eat year round. I just don't. I don't see that happening. But yeah, we've got the Ohio Pawpaw Growers Association. There's the North American Pawpaw Growers Association. There's pawpaw festivals sprouting up now all over the country. I think there's six or seven of them now. And, uh, you know, I think processing the products is another really important aspect of getting it out to the people. And that's kind of like one of our um, mottos is pawpaws to the people. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we have a bumper sticker like that. But, you know, it's kind of like part of the uh, empowerment of getting the pawpaw to become the state native fruit and and so, yeah, and, you know, having having it in your backyard is, I guess, the, you know, the closest thing you're going to get to local local food. And, you know, this whole local food movement is, is blowing up all over the country. And so, I don't know, I'd say it's probably going to be in your backyard or at your farmer's market a lot sooner than you're going to see it as a fresh fruit on your grocery store stand. But, you know, some of the specialty markets, there are um, growers that are, um, distributing it through those kind of traditional, um, those traditional ways, but you know they're only going to be around for a couple weeks uh, mm. out of the year, you know. And it, depending on how the season goes, if it's a hot, dry summer, and like say a hurricane comes through, I mean the pawpaws are they'll fall off the tree, they'll get knocked off the tree, they're done. Now if you pick them slightly under right and you get them into refrigeration, you've got a couple weeks that you can store them like that and transport them. But you gotta you gotta put them on like bubble wrap. I mean you have to treat them like like eggs. Because, you know, every little 
touch you get if you squeeze it, you know, you leave bruises and it winds up looking, you know, not that not that appealing. Well, you know, um, um I, I would just interject. Uh, when I, I lived in Asia for two years, and um, I, as I traveled around Thailand or Cambodia or Laos, they had um, members of the family like uh, Chiramoya, Sweet Sop, and Sour Sop um, all mm-hmm. over the place. And, and it, it seemed like it was for at least half the year, but granted, that's a tropical growing climate. But what they did yeah. was they actually wrapped each individual fruit in like this little stretchy net thing that yeah. like had mm-hmm. pad on it to, to protect it. And apparently mm-hmm. that was enough to protect it during transportation to get it to the markets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, you know, we ship pawpaws to people via UPS and uh, the, the Postal Service, and, and we basically just wrap it up in newspaper and, you know, put them in a box and just make sure they can't get jostled around too much. And we pick them slightly under right so that after two days or so of transport, they arrive and they're in perfect condition to eat. Um, so tell so, us about yeah, it, it, uh, tell, tell us done. about that shipping. Um, like if if someone listening to this podcast wants to get a uh, fresh fruit, what exactly what time period will be you be doing the harvest this year? If you know, and how how much is it to if people want to uh, order some? Okay, um, thinking it's going to be a it's going to be a later crop this year. Last year our harvest started in mid August. Um, this year it's looking like. It's looking like it's going to be early September to mid-September. It's We had a late spring. It's been a very wet and cool summer. So they're just hanging on the trees growing right now. Um, and what we do is we ship a two-pound box for $11. And then you can decide, do you want it UPS or do you want it U.S. Postal Service? And we can ship anywhere in the U.S. Um, we can do the priority mail out west. It uh, gets there in like two to three days. And anywhere on the East Coast, if you want, you know, UPS or U.S. Postal Service, get there in about two days. And, uh, you know, we're going to be actually, we're going to put our, we don't have it on our website right now, but we're going to make it available because we're getting a lot of calls and people are, you know, a lot of times they don't know when they're going to happen. And last year, people would be right to be calling right now, but this year it's going to be a little later. Okay, and if people are interested in the Paw Paw Festival, what are the dates, and uh, I don't know if there's a ticket price or if it's just, like, free to get in, or how does it work? Well, we've got our, our website. It's ohiopawpawfest.com, and it is September 13th, 14th, and 15th, and it's the world's largest Paw Paw Festival, and uh, it's $20 for the weekend. <laughs> wait, wait, wait so, so is there a competition? Is someone trying to, like, have their, their uh, competitive pawpaw festival somewhere? Well, not, I mean, nobody's really, um, we're, we've got many years on other people, and, I mean, we're, I think, we're definitely larger than the other festivals. I mean, but the thing is, is it's, it's a great, interesting hook to get people, you know, like, people are interested in that, you know, like, pawpaw, what the heck is that? I never heard of it. And, uh, You know, we just really had a good time making it available to people and making a really authentic experience for people. We've got, you know, there's people selling fruit, there's people selling trees, there's people selling all kinds of, like, cosmetic products and specialty food products. Um, Art, every art vendor has pawpaw motifs worked into their art. And, you know, the pawpaw beer is huge, and, you know, we even have, you know, we'll sing the pawpaw song, like, way down yonder in the pawpaw patch. You know, so we just, we've had a lot of fun with it, and uh, I think people who have been to our festival, I mean, we've had people from big name magazines like Better Homes and Gardens, we've had the New York Times and um, Pittsburgh Gazette, and, you know, a lot of newspapers, and, and, uh, we just try to make sure people have a good time, and it's become a really big community festival in our area. So, you know, I, I pretty much will guarantee you're going to have a, a good time if you can if you can make it down. Great. And uh, my last question, it wasn't quite in the right order. I should have asked this earlier, but um, I just wanted to ask you, it seems like you're interested in a, a fairly permaculture-esque approach to growing. I know you're big on integrating um, animals into 
um, your uh, setup with these pawpaws and such. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, I, I find it really – I'm, I'm really fascinated by the topic of um, the food forest and, and looking at how the Native Americans used um, trees to basically plant an edible and usable – ecosystem which was really useful you know um the europeans showed up and they're like how are there these perfect mast sized trees like just made for making a ship's mast out of and they didn't realize that it wasn't like a a freak of nature but in fact the indians had like kind of chosen the right trees in, in many of these cases but they also were picking things like um persimmons native persimmons american ones and uh in in the pawpaws spreading them around i'm curious like do you kind of uh, get some inspiration from that? Do you kind of see, hey, well, you know, this this uh, sidewalk, you know, would be the perfect place for a papa, or, or uh, like, how, how does it, how does it, um, kind of influence you? Yeah, no, I'm, I love permaculture. I mean, it's not just growing stuff; it's an ethical design system, and I think it's a really important tool to make the world a better place. And uh, you know, where we live in the Appalachian foothills, we have like 75% of North America's medicinal plants. And a lot of these things are really, um, you know, kind of like, it's like a biological preserve. Um, when, the, when the glaciers came through in the northern part of Ohio, you know, it wiped out a lot of plants and stuff. But the things that survived are, are in the foothills of the Appalachians. And, uh, you know, there's just been a lot of great great plants to work with. You know, you've got one of the most valuable plants that was exported was ginseng, which in these certain slopes and, and uh, like your eastern slopes, northern slopes, you got a great valuable medicinal plant there. And then, you know, you can have your sugar maples, you know, the maple syrup. That, um, we make mushroom logs. We use like poplars for oysters. And we do a lot of shiitakes. And then you got all these fruit nut trees like uh, hickories and, and uh, black walnuts. We also work with black walnuts. Um, elderberries. I mean, there's just a, all these things that don't need a lot to grow in our area, and why not use something that's native? I mean, we seem to skip over the native stuff, and uh, they really need to, we need to pay attention to them because they're, they're more energy efficient, I think. And... Uh, in, when you're doing permaculture, you're doing this multiple functions, and that's that's what we've tried to do with our plan with Integration Acres and using our, our goats to help us manage our pawpaws. We're getting multiple crops out of the same area, and there's like a synergy that makes the whole system work better together. So I'm a, I'm a firm believer in permaculture, and I think it's uh, got a lot of potential. There's a lot of people doing it now. You know, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's just, like, smart, you know? Mm. Okay, great. Well, uh, Chris Meal, thank you very much for joining us. I greatly appreciate you taking the time. Not a problem. Thank you. All right. If you're interested in finding links to uh, Integration Acres, to the Ohio Paw Paw Festival, and to some of the other topics we've talked about, uh, check out the show notes on rawfoodhealth.net's blog. And as always, if you enjoyed this show, if you want to see more of this kind of stuff, do me a favor, go to iTunes, give me a five-star review, and let me know what you think. I read back the best feedback in subsequent episodes. See you later.